we're gonna go to the Everglades Safari Alligator Safari. So we're outside of our hotel right now waiting for the special um, Everglades Alligator Safari bus to pick us up and it's a 45 minute drive from South Beach, Miami Beach and the tour either leaves at 9.45 a.m. or 1.45 p.m. that's what we're doing it's 1.45 and then we're gonna come back at 4.35 and so we're just waiting woohoo we have to put earplugs in Yellow and black. I want me. I've got breaks, so hurry up and take your pictures. Oh. Wait, where are the babies? Look at them all in there. You don't see them in there? All the black and yellow stripes? Oh, yeah! Those are the babies! The Everglades is, if you were to put it in perspective, if you were to take from the top of West Palm Beach to the bottom of Miami and the width of that, you could fit three of those inside of the Everglades. Very large. It's not only one of the world's widest rivers, it's also one of the world's slowest flowing rivers. At its widest point, it's about 50 miles wide. And it flows about one mile every 24 hours from south of Lake Okeechobee, which is north of here, and all this water empties out into the Florida Bay. Okay. Now it's a very unique ecosystem and biosphere because it's the only place in the world that inhabits both American alligators and American crocodiles in the same ecosystem. Mm. Which were the alligators were the ones with the little baby that we saw right now and all the ones that were around the park, okay? American crocodiles live here in the park also, but they live out in the Florida Bay where there's salt water, okay? Big difference between an alligator and a crocodile. How do you tell them apart? Alligators have much wider heads and when they close their jaws, you're only going to see the top row of teeth, okay? Crocodiles, both top and bottom jaws are the same size, so when they close their mouth, you see both rows of teeth interlocking like this, okay? But what really sets them both apart is the fact that crocodiles can live in both fresh water and salt water because they have one thing that's called a salt water gland and it's located right here in the neck area. So anytime that they swallow salt water or anything, any fish or anything that they eat, they can process that salt without dehydration. As where alligators can't do that. I know, I apologize, it's super hot today, guys. <laughs> Trust me, I've been out here all day, you know? Um, but anyways, so that's what sets them apart. Alligators cannot live in salt water. If an alligator happens to wander off into the salt water, he'd probably live for about a week or so, and after that he would die. Crocodiles can live in both fresh and salt water with no problem. They can process that salt, and they can, you know, without dehydration, okay, because of the salt water gland. Now, let me talk to, you, talk to you guys a little bit about the vegetation here and how important it was to the Indian survival. Right now we're going through a very severe drought. Just recently, in the past two weeks, we started to get a little bit of rain. But we haven't had rain here in about three months, okay? And that's why if you guys notice all this right here, all this burnt down about two weeks ago. Uh -huh. And it started off with lightning. Lightning struck, 
I was all the way back there and I saw smoke and before you know it, all this started to catch on fire, okay? I was freaking out, everybody in the boat was freaking out because all there was was a bunch of smoke coming this way and I thought the fire was going to jump from one side to the other. Just to give you guys an idea of how dry it is. Normally this channel right here, the water would be up to this high, okay? Oh. But it's very shallow. In fact, look at all the dead fish because there's no oxygen. Look at that. Okay. That's because there's no oxygen in the water, okay? Right now, the bottom of this boat is touching the bottom of the Everglades, okay? So this water should be normally about three feet higher than what it is right now. Let me ask you another question. Have you guys seen on the internet a picture of a, of, of a, of a snake that ate an alligator and it was sticking out of his side? Have you guys seen that? No. Yeah. It's a picture of surface. You've seen it? Yeah. Alright, if you don't know what I'm talking about, when you guys go back home, Google Everglades, uh, Python, and Alligator. And you're going to see the picture I'm talking about. It's a big problem that we're having here in South Florida. It started two ways. First thing is, back around 25 years ago, we had a hurricane called Andrew, a big, big hurricane. And during that hurricane, there was a guy down south in Homestead that used to breed all kinds of uh, reticulated pythons, African rock pythons, and all those kind of snakes that grow anywhere from 20 to 25 feet. Now, during that hurricane, all those snakes got blown out here into the Everglades, okay? And also, people go to, pie, go to pet shops and they buy them when they're really cute and small. When they start to get too big and too, you know, too heavy on them, they don't want to keep them anymore, so they come and they chuck them out here, which is the wrong thing to do, okay? You're introducing an animal into an ecosystem where they don't belong. That picture that you saw is a real, actual picture that happened, okay? What happened was a 16-foot African rock python ate a 7-foot alligator. Nothing in the Everglades should be eating an alligator. That's a big problem. So when that happened, Florida Fish and Wildlife, which is like the police out here, they're the ones that took that picture and that saw that. They started to investigate the whole situation. And they came to the conclusion that that either was somebody's pet or one of the snakes that got blown out here into the Everglades, okay? But the bigger problem comes in is that these snakes are not only being found here in the Everglades, now they're being found in people's homes, in people's attics, in their sheds, you know, under cars, and grills, all over the place. It's becoming a big problem, you know? I'm going to tell you a little something before I get in. When I get in, you're going to see that the behavior is going to be unusual. They are not drugged, they are not tame, and they are not overfed. Even if you overfeed an alligator to where it can barely walk, or drug an alligator to where it can barely walk, all that is going to allow you to do is get very close, and then the animal is going to bite you slower. The only way to work with an animal as if it knows you is to do just that, get to know the animal. This guy right here next to me, his name is Bobby. Bobby is one of my favorites. He's very well behaved. Bobby. The big guy next to me is Killer. Choice. Just as it is a choice to bite me, they are choosing to behave this way. Okay? Black dots, these are all sensors. They are super sensitive to any touch. If you don't touch him, he can't see directly in front of his face. If you touch him, he'll snap shut, he gets to keep whatever falls in there. It's the strongest bite in the world, nothing comes close. Not lions, tigers, or bears are mine. This tail, this thing is solid muscle. If any one of them were to curl it back and hit me, they'd have no problem breaking my leg. 90% of this animal's life is spent doing this. Absolutely nothing, and they are still 90% muscle. Must be nice, huh? 90% of their life will go to this, five goes to eating, five goes to girls. I think their priorities are messed up. Right? <laughs> These are gator bites from real alligator tail. <laughs> How does it taste chicken. like? Tastes like chicken? Mm, it's the chicken.